Okay, so today is sort of going to be the anti-climax of the, everything we've done so far. So we're going to like get to the market economy, we're going to put everything together, but we're going to realize that that doesn't really tell us very much and that uh, that just raises all the questions we're going to be dealing with throughout the rest of the course. So uh, I'm going to refresh you guys on and then extend the pure trade equilibrium. Remind everybody about the Edgewood Um, so we'll, um, we'll then introduce, we'll talk about the existence of equilibrium, we'll uh, introduce production, everybody make sure you grab an evaluation form uh, and fill it out, give it to Udo. Um, we'll talk about how trade makes production as well as consumption more efficient. Especially, we'll talk about international trade and who wins and loses from international trade. We'll then talk about um, the comparative statics of equilibrium and how those are related to stability. We'll then talk about the welfare theorems um, and why they don't uh, necessarily favor a market economy. Uh, as well as about optimal redistribution and how it's related to the second welfare theorem and then about sort of how this will frame all the questions we're going to be thinking about throughout the rest of the course, in particular the role of information in uh, making a market economy work efficiently and why um, the trade-offs between the ability of the market economy to de decentralize information on the one hand and the distortions uh, that arise in a market economy on the other. Okay. So, uh, let's start uh, by trying to remember why in a pure exchange economy um, trade brought uh, benefits uh, to the economy. Did everyone get one of these um, evaluation forms? Does anyone need it? Please fill it out and give it to Yuto at the end of class who's in the plaid cover. Okay, David Quo. David Guo? David here, no. Okay. Uh, does anyone else want to explain why in a pure exchange economy, from a purely intuitive point of view, there's benefits to trade? Yeah, what's your name? Ro. Ro? R-U-O? R-H-O. R-H-O. Yeah. Why? So, for example, for example, if I value something more, yeah. then, and something, I, I have two things, and then yeah. So imagine that uh, Maria likes candy and I like foie gras, but Maria has all the foie gras and I have all the candy. Then I can give her my uh, candy and she can give me the foie gras and we can both uh, in enjoy it more, right? So. Um, that's exactly what trade allows, and a simple way to represent this was the Edgeworth box, right? So, um, you know, if, if I want one thing and you want another, but we start out with the opposite things, then I can get onto a higher indifference curve and you can get into, onto a higher indifference curve. But at the point where our two indifference curves are tangent to one another, no one can be better off uh, as a result of trade. Another example would be, you know, imagine that there's Saudi Arabia and the United States. Saudi Arabia has a lot of oil. The United States has a lot of crops. If Saudis give us some oil and we give them some crops, they won't starve and we can run our cars. Right? Um, okay. So, not only do we know that there are gains from trade, in fact, we also know that there are these theorems which say that anything that's in equilibrium will be at a point where all of our marginal, all of our uh, indifference curves are tangent to one another, and therefore it will be efficient, right? So at equilibrium, everyone is going to set their marginal rates of substitution between goods. This should be marginal MRS, not MRX, sorry. At the marginal rates at which they're willing to substitute different goods are going to be equal to the ratio of the prices. 
And because everybody does that, we know everyone's marginal rates of substitution will be equal to everybody else's marginal rates of substitution. And thus, uh, and those are just the efficiency conditions for an economy, right? And so, not only is it the case that every uh, equilibrium is going to be efficient, but also anything that's efficient can be implemented as an equilibrium. Each individual's optimization, that they're going to set the ratio of prices equal to their rate, marginal rates of substitution, which you did in uh, the first quarter of this class, um, leads to social efficiency. And this is just the invisible hand of the market, right? Everyone, by doing their little part of the social maximization, uh, together leads the society overall to maximize it. Uh, the allocation of resources. Okay. Um, and to get any other equilibrium from one equilibrium, all we need to do is transfer income between different people. Right? Anything that's efficient happens at some point of tangency. And um, in a lot of ways, what we're going to do today is just going to reiterate and reinforce the way in which production follows the same basic ideas. It's going to make sort of everything tangent to everything else it should be tangent to, and therefore we're going to get efficiency. So let's take the simplest possible example, which is the so-called Robinson Crusoe economy. So this is an island where the only thing to eat is coconuts. And I don't know if anyone's actually read Robinson Crusoe, but it's nothing like this. So <laughs> I don't know why it's called Robinson Crusoe. But anyways, he doesn't eat a single coconut in the whole book. Um, but the Robinson Crusoe model is a model where there's the only thing to eat is coconuts. And coconuts can be produced um, by work. One <coughs> unit of work of labor, L, can produce one coconut. Right? And everybody is the same, i.e. there's like one person who has a utility function, uh, which is a Cobb-Douglas, C to the alpha, 1 minus the amount of time they work to the alpha, to the 1 minus alpha. And there's an arbitrary currency, which is that uh, every unit of labor is always paid $1. Okay. So the firm produces, the firm produces one coconut for each unit of labor and pays its laborers $1. And it has constant returns to scale, so it, its supply is perfectly elastic at $1. <coughs> What's the uh, equilibrium in the market for coconuts? Uh, is some um, um, how do we go about figuring that out at least? Like how many coconuts? Or, I don't okay, so the, there's a firm yeah. which is going to have a perfectly elastic supply at one dollar, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how do we figure out how much coconuts are actually going to be produced in this economy? if everything is supplied uh, for, for one dollar. This is the oh. utility function for the consumers, right? Yeah. Well, if, one use, if everything is supplied for a dollar, would one unit of labor then be a dollar? And then one coconut would be a dollar? So everything would be... Exactly. But the question is, how much do the consumers choose to work? Because you know they need to work in order to buy coconuts from the firm, right? Yeah, it depends on how many coconuts they would, they would need to satisfy. Yeah, well, so this is their utility function, right? It's uh, C to the alpha, 1 minus the amount that they work to the alpha. If the, as you said, which is absolutely right, the price of coconuts is $1, right? And they get a dollar in wages, right? What do they have to do? They just have to figure out how much do they want to work and, how, and then spend on coconuts, given that both of them cost $1 and this is their utility function. And, and the way that they do that is that, you know, they have to, their budget, uh, I don't know what I did here. Sorry, this should be 1 minus L. They, their, their budget is that they can't consume any more coconuts. This should be L here. They can't consume any more coconuts than they work. And so how are they, they going to maximize uh, their utility? Um, well, 
they're just going to maximize the Cobb-Douglas function subject to the constraint that the amount of coconuts they eat is less than or equal to the amount of labor that they do, right? So C is less than L. And uh, if you do that out, the, we get the usual solution whenever you have a Cobb-Douglas function, which is that the ratio of the coconuts that they eat to the uh, amount that they don't work, this should be 1 minus L, is uh, alpha over 1 minus alpha. And so <clears throat> if each worker has one, uh, one day worth of time, then the ratio of the amount of coconuts they have to 1 minus the amount of coconuts they have, because the amount that they work is equal to the number of coconuts they have, is equal to alpha over 1 minus alpha. And uh, Edward, uh, what what's the solution to that equation? Uh, C equals alpha. Yeah. Good. So they they work for amount of time uh, alpha. They relax for amount of time one minus alpha, and they have therefore have coconuts equal to alpha. Right. So that's that's the decentralized equilibrium of this economy. Um, on the other hand, if you were a social planner, uh, just maximizing, you would um, you would maximize. This is this is what the economy can produce. It can produce the amount of labor. Uh, the the economy. If you're just doing it in a centralized way, you realize that the amount of labor to the alpha is, is the utility you're getting from the coconuts. And 1 minus the amount of labor to the 1 minus alpha is the utility that's coming out of uh, the re relaxation. But the solution to this problem is obviously exactly the same as the solution to the consumer's problem. Um, and thus, the social uh, optimum <coughs> is exactly the equilibrium. And Sam, can you explain why that's, those things are exactly the same? Um, because the firm is going to represent the MRT, and then the consumers is going to be the MRS. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly right. So the firm is going to set the ratio of the wage to the price to the rate at which you turn the uh, labor into coconuts, which is just one. Uh, this is the marginal rate of transformation. And the consumers are going to set the relative value of work versus relaxation, their marginal rate of substitution between those things, <coughs> also to the ratio of uh, the wage to the price of consumption. Right. So this is just their marginal rate of substitution. And that's exactly the same as the social optimum. And we can, if there were more than one worker, we could make everyone we could transfer any amount we want. We could take some coconuts from one guy and give them to the other, and he would still, everyone would set their marginal rate of substitution between work and uh, eating coconuts to the ratio of the price of a coconut to uh, the amount of wage that they get for working. Um, so uh, any redistribution can occur simply by moving money around from people. We don't actually need to like tax uh, work or the purchase of coconuts. Um, so, uh, Re? Who's Re? You're not Re. You're, you're Ro. Who, who's Re? <laughs> Is Re here? Okay. Uh, I'll just draw this. So, um, Re Ping Zhu? Okay. Uh, <coughs> the basically what's happening, right, is the consumer has some indifference curve between this is le leisure one minus L, 